So, hi. Uh, it's a bit of a bait and switch today. We're actually with the first person we came to the founder of the Tom Kiko of Lino, Mr. Edward Gibbon. So, I'm the CTO, Mr. Davis, and I'm actually based in New York, not in Sydney. So, this is actually my first uh, in Sydney event. Actually, uh, how long have you been in Vermont for? I think I'm there. Probably four years, five years. Five years, like four. Well, yeah, that's the So, I thought today, instead of slides, So I've already put some SNS. So I'm my maker. We use we use our own token for this. Uh, 
Um, so I have some SMX in there. So I've actually put in, um, you can see I have uh, the total value of my SMX is 400, as I say, and I actually have a debt position to that 177. 177 is my debt position. So in this case, I actually can, um, what I want, want to do is I want to make a collateralization ratio. So the way that the syntax came about was originally it was called hate conclusions or something you know. And the idea was uh, let's create um, a system crypto collateralized, um, crypto collateralized state of coin like DAI, right? Um, the idea is how do we get incentivized people, you and I, everyone, to continually keep it, the collateral up, back in the debt, right? So the price, the collateral here is SMS, just like in Maker, the collateral is ETH, right? The price of ETH against the dollar fluctuates. The price of SMX against the dollar fluctuates. How do we make sure there's enough? Collateral to make sure that the system has enough uh, collateral back the debt. Well, we have to incentivize people, encourage them to actually keep the ratio up. So in this case, I have my collateralized. I have uh, my debt to uh, my debt to SNX value is multiple of six point seven four. So if you take the debt that I have right now, which is one hundred seven seven, and you multiply it by six point seven four, you'll get um, you'll get the uh, the US dollar value of my SMS. So I'm just going to go and uh, I'm just going to go burn this extra thing. So basically, I'm under collateralized. So now I need to get rid of this extra thing, get myself back. The reason being, the way that we incentivize it is we actually have rewards. So if I was going to go claim my rewards, now I've been I've been a stake in the system for a long time, and I have two weeks worth of rewards I can claim. So that you can see I can get basically about, you know, 12.37 SUSD and, and uh, 24 SNS. So you actually get, not only do we give people the SUSD rewards, which is uh, something that's synthetic US dollar that you can use to trade, we also give them uh, rewards in terms of uh, inflation. So we actually inflate SNS for regular cadence and we pay off to people based on the proportion of the debt pool. So the more of a participant you are in Syndex, the more uh, rewards you get for state. But the, col the contrast to the, so the other side of the equation is you take off risk. And the risk is this debt that you have, this 177 like this, right? This debt that I have is a debt position that I have to pay off at some point if I want to get my SNX back, right? So the, the, the whole point of having SNX as collateral uh, is that so you can't just walk away, take the SUSD, and then come back to you at some point. We'll want to go and pay off your debt and give a retrieve your SNX so that then you can sell it to someone else, for example. Um, so, the question so far? I know I've kind of jumped in a midway, so I'm hoping that some of the things will be clar clarified, but it's not straight from the end yet. It's your SNX, it's a hard peg against Yeah, well, it's actually no, it's not hard peg, it's only peg based on this our system. So it's peg based on the fact that um, it's a peg that, you know, it's a soft peg that basically will, will fluctuate. So right now it's a US dollar, it's actually a little off. Uh, you can see that my 8152 SQSD is actually, my 8152 is actually 8121. It's a very thinly traded market right now. There is a market, there's a market on Bitcoin, and this market is not useful, but it's a soft peg. But in our side of our system, we treat it as a dollar. Inside of the synthetic system, when we start talking about exchanging, it's it, it is valued at a dollar and it doesn't change. Is there any real connection to the US dollar? Uh, well, the connection to US dollar is that when we price things like when we get the prices of these Bitcoin, Tezos, all that is against the US dollar. And this one SUSD can always be always equal to one US dollar in the synthetic system. And so, and if that means one US dollar can buy you one, um, one synthetic dollar of a synthetic Bitcoin, then in the system as well, um, one US dollar. So, maybe because I can compare it to Maker. In the Maker system, we have you know the medianizer getting us an oracle of the price of the US dollar. Mm -hmm. Where do you get the price of the dollar? Well, to ETH. Well, we have an oracle to give us the price of ETH, for example. For example, but it's like in terms of the SUSD itself, we treat it as. Stable currency with inside some Right now, we're still on just the, the new, the DAP for people who are staking. We're not even really talking yet about moving synthetics. It's just so people who are trying to create the, the structure of the system, if you will. It's almost like the stake is a, like the miners of Bitcoin, right? Where 
they are performing service and we're incentivizing them to perform that service. It's performing the service of creating debt that can be stretched and <coughs> incentivizing them. Why you exceed So you can exceed it, but you, can't, you don't want to go under it. So, yeah, so right now I'm actually, I'm under collateralized, so I won't have more. So I'm basically, I can't, you can see here that my rewards are blocked. And the way that we, the way that we ensure that everyone keeps their ratio you know, correct is we basically block the rewards until such time as you're, you decide, oh, I'm going to burn some of the excess debt, or I'm going to go buy some more SNS on market. And then raise, uh, raises the ratio. No, there's a liquidation you mean? Yeah, yeah. yeah, no, we don't we actually have that on the roadmap. Uh, it's coming pretty soon, but we don't actually have uh, liquidation. The main incentive, you know, the incentive right now is you can't play the rewards. So I'll just go now quickly. So while that's burning away, um, the, main, the second time I'm going to show you the second DAP we have. Now, this DAP is more designed for traders. Um, lines, right, right. Let's see, I'll zoom in where I can. Um, so basically, this is a pretty powerful view, but it's effectively showing you uh, uh, a place where you can trace this. And this is where it gets quite interesting. Now, you could go on, on Uniswap right now, right? Um, and you could go and you can just put in some ETH and get some SUSD if you want it. So not a very big, it's not a very big market right now, but you could go in and say, I have ETH, I want to get SUSD, I don't want to involve the I don't want any risk of debt, I just want to trade. And you can do that and come into the second app with your SUSD and trade. Okay. So in here, in this case, I happen to be a user who's both. I'm a user who has uh, SUSD because I'm staking. And now I also want to transform it to something else. So in this case, um, you can see in this wallet, uh, sorry, it's not really designed for uh, this, but you can see in this wallet I have some SUSD, I have a ton, almost nothing with Bitcoin, it's in the dust. I've got some ETH and some Litecoin. And these are all synthetic assets. So there is no Bitcoin. So if I take this SUSD and say I want to move all of my SUSD, just um, a number for my issue there. Oh, right, because I didn't actually have enough. I right, 63 SUSD. So if I just, let's say I just take 50 of my synthetic US dollars. Sorry again. And I can move it into that amount of synthetic Bitcoin. You can see that double zero by. So what we're doing is we're using uh, kind of Oracle. Right now it's a centralized Oracle, so it's our own Oracle. It's sitting there reading the prices of chain and it's constantly pushing it to our contract. Hey, this is the price of Bitcoin against this dollar, ETH against this dollar, like so, so we moved on to uh, all of our Oracle prices now are commodities we're going to use in chain. So chain we have a number of decentralized Oracles. So for every single price uh, in our chain and aggregated world, we have a number of different articles supporting it. Uh, and we're moving over the rest of them in a moment too. So let's just move on. Why not? So basically what I'm doing here is I'm taking some of my synthetic US dollar, US dollars and moving them into synthetic Bitcoin. Right, so again, there is no Bitcoin here. This is basically, I'm taking debt that is denominated US dollars, right? Taking that debt, and I'm saying, what is the price of your source Bitcoin? I have this. Okay, let's reprice that debt into um, into ETC. So it's an exchange. It looks to debt, then sorry, it's a debt for all intents and purposes. But there's not order. Right? You're not matching some order. What you're doing is taking debt, denominating one thing, and denominating something else. Right? And so who's the other side? Well, the other side is everyone who's staking this. So when I mentioned before. You saw I had a, I had a debt position about 159.74. That's actually that's actually a percent. We're showing a number right now, but it's actually a debt position. It's a percentage of the entire pool. And as that pool grows and shrinks, 
your number of growing shrimp. So that's the risk you have. So if everyone goes long into eight, they take all their synthetic goes deep, everyone goes to eight, eight doubles, and the debt falls to a double, and you as a state, your, your debt is going to double. So that is one of the risks of using the system. Oh, so you don't issue it. We used to actually have it, but now you actually re you use this stat to, to exchange your USD. So I've just minted SUSD and now I've exchanged it for synthetic. So let's say there's one person in the system, right? And that person issues 100 SUSD, um, and then they take um, they take half of that SUSD, fifty dollars, and move it into Bitcoin. Now the debt pool is half USD and half Bitcoin. The price of Bitcoin doubles and now the debt is going to go up like that. The, big, the US dollar's value is set the same, now the Bitcoin is twice as valuable. Right? So it's gone up to that by 25%. Yeah. 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 Uh, right, so almost done. Uh, so yeah. Um, yeah, all right. Well, I just got a question. So I, I powered through it very, very quickly. There's a lot to it, effectively. Um, the main thing I want to get away with you, I want to uh, leave you with the main takeaway is that using SNX is basically uh, creating a definition. And what you're enabling is allowing people to take that definition at bigger price and it's um, There's a lot of value in that, but there's also a lot of risk in that. Something we're constantly working on. Are you ready? We might do um, uh, maybe one or two questions for the speakers, and then otherwise um, we can save them for after. But yeah, we can Jay. Oh, is there, maybe there is one question. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm still trying to understand whether this is just a gambling game, or whether, I mean, so you, you're taking debt. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, usually I would take debt because I don't want to buy a house or something, but we all massive. Do you envisage that being done with your system, or is it just a gambling? Well, I mean, it's like saying the roof is on the gambling. I mean, it, the difference of gambling, I guess, is that there's usually, you know, it's casino, or there's some sort of house. Like, this is using the real world's prices. There's not, there's no casino or something in the real But if you think of using the roof as gambling, then I guess it's like, okay. We don't envisage, I don't envisage, I don't kind of see the worst of thing um, on the rest of the community, what it's going to be useful. But what we're seeing right now is it's uh, enabling people to get access, access exposure to assets that. And might not otherwise get it. So, so when we go to more stocks and equity, equities, a number of you might not have access to the US equity market, but one would have access to synthetic Apple or synthetic Tesla or something else. We see that as like a very big value. Add. So SNX is uh, well, so SNX is our collateral token. So instead of using it to, it's, it's better to uh, have a token that's completely. It's uh, too. As well, like, wait, so the back of 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 the Well, you, you probably can't do that because there's no market for AUV. If you get to SMX, you don't have to take your AUV by it gets on ether. Then you can do it for the Uniswap to the SMX. Yeah. Right? Then you can take you can take your SMX, you can stake it, and that mints you some SUSD, and then you can take that SUSD and then exchange it into something else. Or you can skip that process, take the ETH, exchange, go to the Uniswap, get some SUSD, and then just move that around. And then you don't have that risk of what's happening to the SMX, but you don't have to reward it. Get out of the Let's Hello. Yeah, um. Oh, it's okay. Yeah. Is that okay for me? Yeah, it's all good. Thanks. Uh, 
Hey guys, how's it going? Uh, my name is Jay. I'm co-founder of Loopring. Uh, Loopring is a decentralized exchange protocol. Um, it's a we create an API to enable people to build up a decentralized exchange on your own. Uh, before I start, I want to ask a question: Like, how many of you have used decentralized exchange before? Or oh, many of you? Oh, that's great. That's great. Uh, so why we use decentralized exchange? Because a few reasons. First is like it's secure. It's no custodian. Um, so for example, like one of my favorite central exchange Binance, um, like last week I tried to withdraw a few coins from that and it takes ages to, to, uh, to uh, receive, uh, to, to get, uh, pro, pro, uh, get through. Um, why? Because central exchange, um, your asset is not in your own pocket. Uh, you don't have the ownership. Um, but decentralized exchange, everything, all your assets is in your own pocket. Uh, second is the transparent. Um, we all know that in crypto world, most of the central exchange, they don't have license or they are unregulated. Um, many of them do manipulate the token and the market. Um, only like a few of them that are, have the um, integrities. Um, that's why we see the price of the central, a few central exchange are, are so volatile. Um, but for decentralized exchange, if you want to manipulate the market, the cost is massive especially um, with the latest decentralized exchanges. Um, we have a latest solution called zero knowledge proof to scale up all the uh, throughputs. The last one is trustless. Um, we don't trust any centralized exchanges. Why? Because um, like last year, there's a, a CEO of central exchange in Canada. He just died and no one can prove his death. But, but apparently he bought like over 20 properties before his death, and no one can, no one can claim his um, uh, private keys. He says he's he's gone, but also he's gone with his private keys. So all the traders, all the customers on his central exchanges, all the assets is gone. This is why we don't trust central exchanges. But if the decentralized exchanges are so good, but why we don't use decentralized exchange? First is the liquidity issues. Um, we all know Ethereum, uh, most of decentralized exchange right now is on the Ethereum blockchains, but Ethereum's throughput is way too slow. Bitcoin transaction speed is like um, under 15. Ethereum is probably like 20, uh, 30. Now it's Ethereum 2.0. Um, it's a, a, a lot faster, but still way too small, uh, way too slow. Um, um, right now up on the market, there's a few decentralized exchange. First one is like, um, a bonding curve base, and which is Uniswap and Banker. Um, second one is quarter base Kyber. We can merge this one and two into one. We can call it like market maker base decentralized exchange. I think Uniswap right now is the most popular decentralized exchange. Um, last, a uh, third one is auction base. Um, it, it's, it's, it's also it, it works well, but it takes ages to uh, to come to pr pr persist. Um, the next one is directives um, like DYDX. I think it's way too, for like directive decentralized exchange, it's a bit earlier. Um, the last one is order base um, like us, 0x and IDEX. Um, I think it's, 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 it's most user-friendly decentralized exchanges because most people can use it straight away. Um, and it's just like the traditional financial market. Um, you don't need education. You didn't educate the customers to use it. Um, but the problem, the downside is um, the throughput, um, as I say, uh, decentralized chain, you place the order, it takes ages, even you click, you match the order, it takes ages to, uh, to, uh, settle, to settle and clear it. Um, but right now we have the new solutions. Um, I, I, do some, I did some conclusions, like right now we have three, genera three, kind of, uh, um, three generations of this decentralized chain technology. First is we put everything on the blockchain which take uh, a lot of data for the blockchain and take a lot of times to process. And second one is we do part of job off chain and then um, some like settlement clearing and um, verification still on the blockchain, uh, which is like ether data. Um, the latest, latest one we call, um, um, or oh, we use a technology called uh, zero knowledge 
a ZK roll-up, uh, which we do all the settlement clearing off-chain and only put the verification on the blockchain. And this can massive, massively increase the Ethereum's throughput. Um, so, because I, I do everything for my team, but I'm an engineer, so uh, I won't go too, too deep. I, I won't go too deep. Uh, basically, we use a, a marker tree to generate the proofs and then only put the verification on the Ethereum blockchain. Um, by using this uh, ZK rollup, we can massive, massively increase speed. And here's a data you can see. Um, like, um, with, so Loopring 2.0 is like, uh, like, uh, like the older version of decentralized exchange, as I say. Um, why we don't use decentralized? Because the throughput. It, um, like if, 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 if we all know like last year, uh, or even like um, all the decentralized exchange back in, uh, back, back in days, uh, it takes ages to process. Um, the transaction speed tra trades is like two per second. But with ZKP, um, you can increase up to like 350 or even more than, if you, if you compromise a bit of security, uh, it, the speed can go up to almost 7,000. Um, and after Istanbul, I think um, also after Ethereum 2.0, uh, the speed can increase up to 1,040, uh, 1,400. And we, if you give up a bit of security, uh, the speed can go up to like over 10,000. So 10,000 TPS for Ethereum is, is a huge jump. Um, for example, Visa or PayPal, their TPS is about like uh, 20 to 30,000 per second. Um, so if we put, um, so here's, uh, so we, we did a bit of uh, 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 in, in invited beta te test uh, around Christmas time. So we invite around, a hundred people to trade on our um, DEX. Um, and uh, the result turns out is uh, huge for the Ethereum communities. Uh, first is um, it, it, it improved that uh, ZK rollup can massively increase the throughput. Um, and second is it can also reduce the cost. Um, right now the cost per trade is down to almost like half. Uh, Three thousands. Um, so, um, as I say, we, we, we work with a decentralized exchange called uh, Widex. Widex is the first uh, Loopring 3.0 integrated decentralized exchange. So we, we work with them, and and the um, we start a invite only uh, beta version uh, test, and we invite all around hundred people, but it's like hundred addresses, and some of them already have like. Uh, double uh, two addresses, um, and then there's almost one million um, transactions have been uh, settled uh, in six days. Uh, about our roadmap, uh, so we we deploy our protocol, uh, the, the latest zero knowledge proof protocol, um, last year August, and then uh, we start our um, invitation only a beta. Uh, this month, um, then we will launch our own decentralized exchange, the first zero knowledge proof integrated uh, decentralized exchange in March. Um, so we actually have been doing this for almost two and a half years, and uh, we just decided to uh, to switch to to like um, to to um, to. Uh, so I should say uh, we we did this for two and a half years, but uh, um, in the first two years uh, we. We 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 uh, we funded the problem about decentralized change uh, and also the uh, Ethereum blockchain. So the lesson we have learned is first is um, you shouldn't rely on Ethereum blockchain to scale up speed. Um, if you have a solution, you should do it. You ha you have to do it yourself. And also for the uh, exchanges, um, the most important most important things is about the liquidities. So if you want to if we want to uh, run or operate at Exchanges, you have to first, uh, you have to provide liquidity. Secondly, liquidity. The lastly is also liquidity. So liquidity is the key for whether it's central exchange or decentralized exchanges. Um, so 
as I say, we have been doing this for uh, two and a half years, uh, since 2017, and we did our token sale um, back in August 2017 and raised about like 120,000 ethers. Uh, back then was about like um, 40, 40 to 45 mils. Um, there was the second largest um, blockchain project uh, in Asia. The largest, largest one was Tezos uh, globally. Um, and our team, um, we are very decentralized. Uh, we have office in Shanghai, um, New York City, Valley, and Canada, and Belgium. Uh, our community now have over 20,000 um, people. Um, I also want to say uh, we have an incubator in Hong Kong uh, at the Cyberport. Um, what, um, one of the reasons I'm here today is we're looking for um, like potential startup, blockchain startup, so we can help them to um, incubate or to grow. Um, like a few services we, we provide is like FA service and we provide um, a uh, uh, anniversaries. Um, also, we, we do uh, work with PwC, so the incubator we set up in Hong Kong that uh, was uh, uh, partnered with PwC and the Hong Kong local government. So, um, and here's the portfolio that uh, all those projects have been used, fully used our service or partially used our service. Um, yeah, if you want, uh, if you have good ideas about blockchain or if you want to be incubated in our incubators, uh, feel free to uh, shoot me an email. Yeah. Thank you very much. Oh. Uh, Sorry? Oh, okay. Um, first, we have in-house uh, market makers. Um, and also, we will spend uh, money to, uh, to, to encourage or to motivate external market makers to provide liquidity in our exchanges. Yeah, I think that's the key. Um, like, uh, if you see our portfolio here, uh, Bybit. Uh, Bybit, I think, is the most successful uh, exchanges in 2019. Um, um, so the lesson we have learned, and we, there's also an uh, exchange called Fcoin. We, in, we invested back in 2018. Um, if you know Fcoin, they do uh, trade and mining at the same time. So the, the lesson we have learned is uh, at the beginning, you have to, you know, you have to burn uh, monies, capitals to, um, to set up the market, to, uh, to build up the liquidities. But later on, once you have enough growth, uh, enough customers, then um, and all the market makers are, you know, market makers, they're looking for uh, profit, then they will come to you. Yeah, at the beginning, you have to, you have to uh, have incentivize them. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, as you know, Bybit is a uh, directive market uh, exchanges. So we've been um, talking about this, but it's hard to be honest. Like um, I talked to uh, uh, Umar, uh, UMA protocol. Uh, they are going to launch their uh, decentralized uh, directive exchanges, but it's gonna be a bit difficult. Yeah, we will see. But at the beginning, I, I will say, uh, we'll focus on spot trading first, yeah. Sorry. Oh, yeah. 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 I just it yep, no, you keep going. So just so say the question again. Yeah. Why do you think Uniswap has been so successful? Why? Um, like, yeah, me, I like, uh, I'm also, personally, I'm a big fan of Uniswap as well. First, they don't issue token. I think there's good integrity. And second is they give the uh, rewards back to the communities. Like the way they, um, they, like everyone, they create their own smart contract and you can be your own market makers. Uh, I think like, Liquidity for market maker uh, for the Uniswap is is very important. Yeah, uh, and they don't charge fees. <laughs> I mean, like, uh, uh, yeah. I mean, I don't, they they are not in a rush of. They don't have any financial uh, stress at the moment. So I asked I asked Adam was when he decided to charge fees. He said no, 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 no plan. So, uh, but they are going to uh, also scale up with optimistic roll up. Uh, we will see. How it goes because of this, you know, takes longer time to, yeah.
uh, uh, we use uh, ZK Snarks. Yeah, there's also uh, ZK Snarks and Optimistic Row Up, um, but a start, they all, all, there's pros and cons, but eventually we decide to use Snarks because we want to do everything with data availability. I think security is the key, so yeah. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Yes. Yes. Um, so I, I can't hear you properly, uh, but uh, uh, and uh, there's next speakers. I can come to you to talk about it. Yeah. Thanks again. Yeah. What? Yeah. I knew that one. I knew that one. Sweet. Hey everyone, how's it going? It's good to see some familiar faces. Um, I'm James from Alpha Wallet and one of the developers and uh, co founders. I'll be taking you through something a little bit different today, just a kind of quick introduction to the two most popular DeFi products that are out there, namely uh, Compound and Maker CDP and a few of the pitfalls that come with it that you may not be aware of, uh, and an open question about compliance at the end. Um, just quickly, in a nutshell to me, what DeFi is is basically uh, financial instruments that exist on an open, uh, verifiable blockchain and can be extended uh, at will by anyone, uh, which is quite different to what we have with the existing system. Slightly off the... Well, there we go, that will do. Um, yeah, using DeFi today is kind of confusing. I know the first time that I ever used a CDP, I was super confused, you know, what is stability fee, liquidation price, uh, collateralization ratio. Um, it's quite different to what you'd expect uh, when you typically go to make a loan at a bank, for example. Uh, let's say you go to buy a house, typically you put, say, a 20% deposit down and the remaining 80% would be secured by the bank. Um, so with DeFi instruments, at least the ones that are popular now, uh, that's kind of flipped. You would give at least 150% uh, of your uh, uh, loan up as collateral, um, which would be really weird in the traditional sense if you were to say, I'll give you 150% of the money for the house in advance. Um, and so I was super confused until I looked into why people even do this in the first place. And uh, the most obvious answer is uh, speculation, of course. Um, so let's say you're, you're Bob, you got 10 Ether, um, you got no extra money to buy more, but you believe it's going to go up 100%. Um, in that situation, uh, the best thing you can do is put it into a CDP, like the MakerDAO CDP, and generate DAI, which is, of course, as you know, dollar-pegged uh, uh, dollar uh, stablecoin backed by Ethereum. And, and let's say you're correct about your prediction. Within the span of one year, the price does go up 100%. But well, that's greater than the die loan you had to pay of, say, 6% interest. And therefore, you made a profit. Um, of course, when, when you're coming to speculation, the opposite is also true. If, you were, if the price were to go down, then you would not only lose on the depreciation of your underlying asset, but you also have to pay back the interest. Um, you also have another risk that basically your loan will be closed at any moment if the price ever slips to a really low level. Um, I happen to know someone in the room who did this, but I won't, won't name any names. Uh, but yeah. Uh, so with that, that kind of segues me into the next point. What are the major risks when you're using a DeFi product, uh, namely Compound, uh, for example? The big open question still is, is it actually decentralized? 
Uh, in the case of Compound, the answer is not quite. Uh, for one, they have what's called a price oracle that feeds the prices into the smart contract to let you know what price, for example, Ether is. This seems like quite a trivial detail, but when you think about it, if someone managed to hijack such a key which fed the price in, then you could basically set the price of any asset to whatever you want. So you could set Ether to $1, which would not only close a lot of people's positions if they were borrowing, but you could also borrow against them at a very low rate. Furthermore, uh, Compound actually has a weird thing where basically they have admin keys. Uh, and if you manage to seize control of these admin keys or the Compound team themselves who control the admin key were to somehow be compromised, you can basically freeze anybody's funds at will and lock the whole pool up entirely. The other traditional risk that still exists uh, from the banking uh, world is uh, you still have bank runs. Uh, in, in a typical DeFi instrument like Compound, you're rewarded uh, with higher interest if the pool of the money that you're loaning to, for example, DAI, is highly utilized. That means many people are borrowing against it. Uh, so it's just basic supply and demand. But when the pool hits, say, 90% or 95% or even sometimes 99%, that means only a small percentage of money is available to be withdrawn at any point of time. Uh, that means if anyone ever gets spooked and the utilization rate is 99%, then only 1% of the money will be able to be withdrawn. Um, you guys briefly touched on Uniswap before. Uh, you could still sell, for example, this interest-bearing uh, compound token on Uniswap to get your money out. Uh, but assuming everybody's trying to do that at the same time, then the price would collapse. Uh, unfortunately, also, we still have the same Web 2.0 tricks uh, in the Web 3 world. Uh, this poor fellow up here got fished, basically, and lost 14 grand worth of, uh, or 14.1 grand worth of uh, legacy die. Um, and we all kind of think, oh, yeah, that would never happen to me. It's kind of funny or whatever. Um, but it's actually really easy for that to happen. Uh, every time you use a service like Compound, you send what's called an approval transaction. So let's say I want to loan 100 DAI to the Compound platform. I have to approve their smart contract to move all the DAI on my behalf. That means, though, at the same time, that it's super easy to basically fork the Compound website, which is open source anyway, uh, run it on a, another domain like Compound with zero that looks very similar, and then change the smart contract, which you approve, to a malicious one. And you could trivially steal all the money. Um, and it's kind of even worse than the traditional system because uh, in this case, there's no recourse. There's no way to get your money back if you're ever pulled, uh, like this poor guy. So that's where I kind of segue into, uh, well, it's small. Yeah, where I segue into DeFi and Alpha Wallet. Uh, so we allow every token to, uh, that runs inside our wallet to basically write what's called a token script. A token script is a, it's an open framework which allows you to define all your token logic in a simple file, and then you sign it. Uh, and by signing it by a valid authority, your users know who the token script comes by, from. And they can basically access each token module, i.e. token script, inside their wallet uh, and know that everything works like it's supposed to. So it's very trivial to, say, convert your legacy die, uh, psi into DAI. Uh, you know, wrap your ether, which is commonly used for many DeFi platforms, and deposit straight into Compound without having to worry about whether it's the real Compound. So, with all of that in mind, I want to end with a question. Hopefully, you guys can help me with this. Uh, that's the big one, which is compliance. I'm still really confused about that myself. Uh, I recounted a funny conversation I had with an ATO agent. Um, since I'm here in Australia on a temporary visa, most people who have temporary visas are exempt from capital gains tax on crypto and also uh, tax if you earn interest on, say, a foreign bank account. So I wanted to ask her, where does uh, a platform like Compound fit in this equation? Because you can't really say where it belongs or you know, what jurisdiction it's in. So I call her up. I say, you know, what does this count as? Is this foreign interest? What is it? And she was obviously perplexed going, you know, how, how can it even run in a smart, what is that? Like, where is it? And where is the team from? And, and, and I said, well, you know, the team is probably in the US. I think they are for compound sake. Um, but 
of course, there's no real jurisdiction for that. And so she said, well, I'm pretty sure I can confidently say that that is foreign interest and therefore exempt, but I highly doubt the US is going to just sit down and let this happen without them knowing about it. And I said, what do you mean exactly by that? And she said, well, I'm, I'm, going, to, I'm going to be pretty sure that they're going to want them to pay their taxes uh, on that somehow. And that got me thinking, first of all, how would they even do that when you don't know who's who on the platform since you're interacting with your Ethereum address? Um, and furthermore, uh, how will they even be able to change the logic inside the smart contract to comply with any of the rules? But uh, maybe that's where those admin keys come in after all. Um, and if any of you know, please let me know at the end. I'd love to know a bit more about how regulation would work in that situation. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So it's sort of like a pre-approved process to get in. Thanks, Ron. Passing that around. So, can we get the panelists up at the front, please? James, Philip, Eddie, any particular order? Jay, Justin? Thank you. Um, nope. Whatever you like. See you. Um, this will be the mic that we pass around because it's what the internet can hear. Um, I'm sure we have hundreds of viewers. Thousands. Thousands, sorry, yes. Thousands of viewers. All right, oh, so that's going to have to be it. As best we can, pass this around as a mic, but we also have the mic for the for in here, so we'll just leave one down here. So, and that should be on as well. Yep, and this one as well. And I should be wired up. Um, Mehdi, did you want to press your button? It should go green. Oh, oh good, excellent. <laughs> so, thanks, Vitalik. No. Okay. Um, Thank you everyone for coming. Um, we'll just do a short intro for those who haven't yet introduced themselves. So uh, there was going to be, oh, we are getting feedback. Maybe we only need, you know, I'll turn this one off. Um, I'm going to keep that one. Off. So, there we go, it's easier. Yep, so um, yeah, Nicholas couldn't make it. So we'll start with Mehdi. I think your mic should be on, but you're going to have to take this one. <laughs> hey everyone, uh, my name is Mehdi. I'm a co-founder and director of Sigma Prime. We are an information security consultancy, mostly based out of Sydney, working on uh, blockchain projects. We actually have a couple of our clients here on the panel. Um, we are also quite well known now for being the founders and maintainers of Lighthouse uh, and ETH2 uh, Rust implementation.
So I need both. Yeah. I give you that. Oh, thanks. All right. Hi, guys. Um, I'm Philip. I'm running a small startup called Coblox here. We are an R&D lab of 10x. And we develop a cryptographic protocol called Comet, which solves blockchain interoperability. So what does it mean? We heard quite a bit around DEXs already, trustless trading. But um, how, does it, how, does it, how does it even work? So does any one of you guys have maybe a bounty and want a Snickers? Yeah. I need both. So anyone, anyone having a bounty and want a Snickers for that? Oh, sweet. So we don't, we don't know each other, right? I don't know that guy. All right. <laughs> so let's, let's assume I hold some Bitcoin here, Bitcoin Maximalist, and he holds some Ether, the bounty, and we want to exchange that, but we don't trust each other, right? The traditional way would be going to... <laughs> exactly. So we go, <laughs> we go to an exchange. So you're on an ex exchange, right, Justin? So we give it to you, and... We trust him that he now does the swap for us and hand it back to us. But we can't rely on that. He might just turn around, eat both of the chocolate bars or randomly die in India. So we don't want that to happen. That's why we... Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you cannot. That was too fast. So what we develop is a cryptographic protocol so that we can exchange the two assets at the same time atomically which means there's not a single point of time where one party holds both ad assets. So neither me nor him can run, run away with those assets. We exchange them at the same time, and then at the end, we're both happy. Easy, right? And I'm not gonna draw this now. Uh, just to kick things off, but we'll expect um, questions from the audience. So what we'll do when you have a question, I guess just write shout it out, and then this person answering it, if you nominate who wants to answer it, or anyone can take it, they'll have to repeat the question, or, or I'll do my best to. Um, all right, so starting with whoever wants to take this first question, um, how would you explain, explain DeFi in a nutshell? Easy one for this audience. DeFi in a nutshell, or better still, um, explain it like I'm five, if anyone wants to challenge. That's what I just did, right? For someone who's five. <laughs> well, say, so DeFi is, you can think of an open, non-custodial, censorship-resistant financial ecosystem. And that involves everything from payments to trading to loans to insurances, options, all kinds of financial instruments. And trustless means there's no trusted third party. Like we just did the trade, the swap. We didn't have to trust anyone in the middle. That's DeFi. I was just going to say for the five-year-old that we're just uh, playing marbles with money. Excellent. Cool. All right. Um, so we did. Was there a continuing question from the audience? I mean, I'm, I'm tempted to pick up the one that Ron kicked off, but also was quoted um, by a long-time community member, Peter Book. So just to read uh, this, um, almost all of DeFi, oh, I'm not actually doing anything I should be doing. But um, yeah, I'll take both. All right, we'll get a better sound system. For, we'll get a better sound system for next time. So um, Peter Boot, yeah, brought up in the chat that um, almost all of DeFi is just using blockchain um, as just another platform for speculating. And it also says um, markets which participants are primarily speculating are zero sum. So, uh, yeah, my question is sort of, uh, is this enabling a new breed of uh, like those of Wolves of Wall Street or um, are even setting things up for a kind of GFC-like crisis? Yep, great, James. So are we all speculating? I mean, I guess the answer is yes. It's still a speculative tool. But uh, most things start like that. Like the first cell phone was only for the Wall Street executives and then slowly it got better, cheaper, and then now everybody can have a cell phone. So it's probably the same progression that will happen in this industry. We just haven't seen that yet because we're so early. But yeah. 
Um, I, would, I would actually question the speculation part of things because what does speculation mean? Is trading speculation, forex trading, is stock exchange trading speculation? If that stuff is speculation, that yeah, everything we do on blockchain is also speculation. Cool. Um, I think to answer your question, I, I come from a country where uh, it's super hard to get access to certain financial instruments. I was born and raised in Morocco. Uh, there's, a, there's a huge um, monetary sort of policy control by the current government. And I'm not sure if, I'm sure some of you went to uh, DevCon in Osaka. Um, there was this great talk by Mariano Conti, who's a developer at Maker, who's been um, surviving or living or avoiding the uh, terrible things that have been happening to the, his economy by using DAI. So I personally definitely see the value of uh, DeFi from like individual level. Um, it's obviously not yet, I'd say ready yet for the masses, uh, simply because we're not able to perhaps democratize this tool um, and make it accessible to the mainstream public. But um, for me, at least coming from that background, uh, it definitely makes sense. Obviously the speculation part um, is, is there and I agree with you, I agree with your um, assessment. Uh, but doesn't for me it doesn't mean that we should be you know sort of stopping um, everything we're doing because it can be abused. Um, I clearly see value in um, what you know most of these people are building. Uh, just a small point for me. I, I kind of touched on this before, but there are different types of learners right out there, and I happen to be a type of learner that likes to tinker, right? A kinesthetic kind of learner. So for me, this has been really, and I I find it really useful in learning about financial products. And I like to hope that there are a lot of people out there in the world and. We've seen them in our community. I'm sure you've seen them out there too. That that are now talking with a lot of depth and intelligence about financial engineering. Like that's this is a backbone of our you know capitalist society. And like to be able to talk about it meaningfully is pretty powerful. Like even if you had 0.01 ETH, you can still do a fair bit. Okay, yes, there's gas, and eventually you're going to run out of gas. But you know you can actually start to learn about the things. Like what a leverage long is. Like you can learn that that's what that's what you're doing with with Maker, right? Like if you buy more ETH, it's like I think that's that's a pretty powerful uh, a powerful narrative beyond just speculating is, is teaching. Great, excellent. All right, um, just keep looking around. If you do have a question, please feel free to call out. Um, so we've uh, yeah, you brought up a couple of um, use cases there, like where um, maybe a country's economy isn't as, as strong, so they'll revert to something like um, cryptocurrencies as being more stable and more um, useful. Uh, what are some other use cases of DeFi? I mean, I guess it, at some point it's uh, it's kind of has a 10x improvement in its own. Like you get 10 times the amount of interest you earn uh, on a typical bank account, but also uh, for the first time, anyone can hold US dollars without having to actually hold them directly in a bank account. This so is to go on Medi's point in Morocco, for example. I know that their currency, the dirham, is uh, closed and you can't buy it from overseas. Um, but if anyone in Morocco wanted to accept U.S. dollars, they would they would have to make a bank account otherwise, which would be pretty difficult. But you could accept DAI very easily. And so you kind of bypass the regulation there, which is a first use case. Yeah. Well, so you call out the question and then the speaker will do that. Um, yeah, I just want to add on a bit. Um, from a decentralized exchange perspective, um, so it, it provides you... Um, a way to do a peer-to-peer -peer trading. Um, so if you don't have um, decentralized exchange, the only way, the only solution for you to, to trade your asset is either off-chain, like from face-to-face, -face, which you have to trust this person, or um, you have to send to a centralized exchange. But with decentralized exchange, it's non-custodian trustless trading experience. So uh, I think it's, it's, it's a really good uh, example. Yeah, I'd say that, um, you know, with DeFi, you can actually get behind something and be a part of something that you value and you can be financially rewarded for that, right? Like you can, um, you can add to the supply of, of DAI, right? Or you can add to, to you can be a, a staker at SNX. You can actually get behind something that you, you actually value and you think is adding um, value to the world. And I think that's, that's a pretty, that is a bit, a bit compelling to a lot of people. Is there a question in the back? Uh, yeah, we'll try this for a bit. <laughs> okay. So 
most of the use cases you mentioned are kind of like a niche. Do you think DeFi, I mean, it's kind of like, I feel DeFi is a niche at the moment in general because blockchain is probably a niche at the moment. Like some people might dispute it, but mass adoption is not there yet, I would say. Um, do you think DeFi is already very innovative? And do you think it will escape the niche of, for example, being like in a country where you don't have certain accessibilities because of international regulations? Yep. I, I would say that totally depends on, oh, my bounty, uh, totally depends on what kind of product you're talking about. So if you think of payments, I think we are, we can have mass adaption soon if we invest time into UX, UI, education around how to treat private keys, trading maybe as well. But if you want to go collateralize stable coins, um, I don't think we are there yet. People don't even understand how mortgages and loans and money works in particular yet. I feel like the whole space is a niche at the moment. So it's not particularly, um, it's just the DeFi space within the blockchain space that, that's a niche. Um, that's just my, my view. more tiny little addition um I and mean, it's probably obvious to all of us but you know transacting on a blockchain costs money right um that's you, why is somebody going to spend money for something they're going to usually spend money because there's, there's something they value right and for most people it's an idea of making more money so i mean yes it is DeFi is a niche but it gets people through that um that threshold of am i going to spend money on this and i don't know what other applications they will do but i think that's it's something we really have to deal with right like our users of our platforms are super passionate because they make money if we do well, but by the same token, they have to get through that. Oh, I got to spend money every time I want to do something. Especially if they're, if they, if they're long ether, right? Which probably most of us are, you're basically spending this thing you're long with just to be, just to be able to use the system. That's kind of nuts. Um, what about some other applications of, um, I guess, financing of projects is like, where would that touch into some of the work? anyone's doing here sort of um, like raising funds for particular projects is that part of DeFi or is it simply raising money for money's sake yeah we uh, we get a lot of donations uh, in DAI uh, some of you have donated thank you so much um, there's this uh, great platform called Gitcoin that uh, basically allows you to sponsor some of the uh, open source projects out there that are building public goods uh, I'd like to think that Lighthouse, our ETH2 client, is one of them. Um, so a lot of people have been donating DAI. Um, so I think to answer your question, that's definitely a way that we could use for you know, people like us, our teams, to get funding in a decentralized way, which is super exciting. Uh, I mean, do you see the DAOs like Moloch and MetaCartel as, as DeFi? Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah so it's like a funding model, right? Yeah. It's like, and we're seeing DAOs finally come back after the great DAO hack. We're starting to see, you know, a bit of a bit of innovation in the space. Yep, absolutely right. Yeah, because I I don't I think it's kind of self like I always consider it as a governance instead of DeFi. So yeah, I don't. In my opinion, I don't think they are similar. Uh, you mentioned Moloch. Moloch is going to upgrade their contracts. I'm not sure if, does everyone know what Moloch DAO is? Yeah, you, no, I'll, I'll explain very briefly. Uh, so Moloch is uh, started by a couple of people uh, who were really, really concerned about the sustainability of uh, Ethereum development. So basically, um, if we all rely on the Ethereum Foundation to provide grants to people building the future Ethereum or lots of tools that people are using on a daily basis, that we're probably in trouble. Uh, so these guys are heavily, obviously, exposed to uh, Ether. You know, these, these, you, can, you can potentially call them whales. Uh, and they started this group, uh, which basically pulls a lot of funding, right? So if you want to join, basically you send, uh, I think in the past it was 1,000 Ether. It's probably dropped to um, 100 by now. Uh, and basically you're now part of this great community that essentially votes on proposals, right? So uh, Lighthouse got actually a grant from Moloch DAO to fund an external security review so that the money that we're actually getting from Moloch DAO will be used to pay uh, a vendor to review our code base. Um, and it's quite, quite an exciting tool, I think. Um, I, 
I, I agree. It's, it has a lot to do with governance. Uh, but at the same time, Moloch is upgrading their contracts and will be using DAI as, uh, as the actual token to be um, you know, distributing across all these projects that are funded. So to me, it is definitely part of DeFi. Um, and it's definitely something that we're very, very excited about. Uh, uh, can you can you elaborate on the rage kick? Rage, rage quit. Yeah. I don't. I put a thousand ETH. Yeah. I don't like what's happening. I quit. Yeah. Um, rage kick, and then you guys can kick me out. So does does I'm the happy. rage quit uh, still remain? Rage, yeah. So okay. Cool. Action. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So I so the way it works, you get actually allocated shares uh, within Moloch. So as a grant recipient, you don't actually get directly ether or die, you get shares. And then it's up to you to rage quit those shares to get your ether back. Um, I, I think it kind of makes sense to me. It, this, this is a, like, tight, a tight group of people. Uh, and it's, uh, going back to your point, it's about governance. And if these people decide that someone is you know, no longer really participating and doing their duties and they're not voting on proposals, what, why should they be here in the first place? Um, that's just my opinion. Um, and in terms of um, products, like um, sort of what level would you say they're at? Like some of the products, are, they look pretty polished, they're, but they're obviously quite, still for the, for the niche. They're quite specific to people who know what they're doing. Um, how far away do we think uh, maybe a broader audience will be able to approach DeFi? What, what's on the roadmap for, <laughs> for synthetics? No. Well, I mean... I mean, for us, obviously, we'd like to get, uh, we'd like to get traders in, right? We, uh, I've talked to a few of you about our, um, our distribution of synths, and we're very, very long crypto. And if you look at average traders, if you look at something like BitMEX, I mean, crypto traders there, you'll see like a lot of longs and shorts and a nice good balance. Um, you know, for us, it's like getting, uh, getting those people who actually don't always think that long is the right way into the platform, getting actual regular traders, because most of us, or most of the people who use the platform are, are crypto enthusiasts who, are, I love crypto, I think it's going to, it's going to moon, right? Whereas regular traders don't really think that way. Want to add to that? Um, so um, I would say, um, like, um, in general, like DeFi user has more knowledge than the regular traders um, because DeFi requires a lot more knowledge. Like you have to use MetaMask. I, I would say like more than ninety percent of no, 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 like probably. Over ninety percent of traders they don't even know about MetaMask or the other uh, uh, wallet. Um, but uh, in order to have mass adoption, uh, I think you have to think the other way. Like how to how to make your product more user friendly. Um, like for us, I will give example um, um, because because like even for decentralized exchange, like the former decentralized exchange, you have to. The Ethereum is, you cannot trade Ethereum. You have to wrap it. That's also make people more difficult. Or at least like for me, I don't, you have to make an extra effort to do that. So by doing this, um, we going to do, what, what, what we're going to do is we're going to um, uh, create a, a build up, uh, create a smart, con a smart wallet. Um, so in the future, I would say um, the user, they don't need hold ether in the wallet to be able to send the token by just in just say uh, why you have to pay the gas. So um, as long as you have any ERC20 tokens, you can still send or receive or whatever um, actions you want to do um, on your own asset. And also uh, there, were no, there will be no private keys. There will be just like a, a very um, like general password for you to keep this um, uh, um, private keys. The private key will be somehow in a smart contract. Um, so um, I think all these things, um, like there's a project called Argent, and uh, they are doing this, um, and the, the product already launched. Uh, if you guys want to give a shot, um, yeah. So um, so there will be more and more advanced technology coming up, and make and people feel um, seamlessly decentralized product. Yeah.
Thanks. I mean, I, I think uh, probably over time, there'll be more incentive to create a wallet in the first place. So if, for example, you could get, uh, say, a cryptographic attestation from the driving authority in Australia uh, to say you have a driving license, for example, and that would be tied to your key, which would be in your wallet, then you'd have more incentive to, to get a key in the first place, even outside of crypto. So like, for example, you could sign up for something that requires ID much faster. Um, and over time, there'll be more reason to have a, a key for yourself, which then you can later add crypto into um, if there's something else that's compelling to go along with it, which I think we'll see develop over time. Yeah. Uh, one more point on the mass adoption. I think the question was when do we see or if we see it coming? Uh, that's a big scary term. And I, I'm not sure if you can call see mass adoption on DeFi in general. Again, it's on a different product. So what I see coming in the near future are products where you get interest. So in the traditional financial markets, you don't get any interest anymore, right? Like on your bank account, you get zero point something interest. But on in DeFi products, uh, there are still five, seven percent interest in there. Just yesterday, we heard about BlockFi, I think, where you get five percent interest for putting Bitcoin in. That's quite good. So I think for that, the onboarding part is not that hard. You only have to solve the UX. You can trust someone with your private key, but you get five percent interest. You can't get that anywhere else. And then you get mass adoption step by step. I had one thing to that. Um, so just something, Jay, you were saying about uh, kind of abstracting away the complexity of wallets. I've been talking to a few newbies about like crypto. And of course, you know, one including my partner who just like rolls her eyes when I'm explaining some of the stuff that goes on. And like, she's like, this is the most ridiculous UI I've ever seen. Um, but there's an element of, and I wonder this because like, how much do we want to hide the basics of private keys from users? Because you know, there's no, there's no fail safe. You know, you lose your private key, you lose everything. Like I'm just, I do worry about that a little bit. Like we can make it super easy for them and Arjun has the social contracts. And, you know, there is that, but it's important for them to understand, I think, to understand the gravity of this. How do we solve, like, how do we, how do we solve it? How should we hide it from them or not? Yeah, it's, I guess it's always that, um, the trade-off between convenience and security. Um, when you are mentioning that they're using a password rather than the private key, that's yeah, a bit of a flag uh, from a security point of view. They have reset password, right? So yep. most people think yeah. in the paradigm what they know and most people know reset password. Yep. Like, oh, maybe that doesn't exist. And they're like, oh, you lost everything. Yep. And Yeah, exactly. So, um, uh, yep, further questions from the audience? Nope. Um, in terms of investment applications, um, I guess, if, you know, financing, um, you know, speculation of where a, finance, of where, um, a price might go. Um, what about, um, like, uh, I'm just thinking of Common Stack, for example, where they're looking at funding models for, or, or um, continuous organizations, like different types of funding models for particular applications. Um, I'm just going to call this an ignorant question. Is this sort of, is that outside of DeFi, like financing of other things? Or is it simply like, what would you say is the edge of DeFi before it starts being just spending money on a product or an idea? Or... or Construe the question any which way you like to something that makes sense. It would, it would kind of be when you get a loan on those common stack shares. So if you, you know, had a, you know, if you minted an equity token, yep. it's when you wanted to get a loan on that, then that would be DeFi. Okay. Cool. I got a question at the back. Yes. I think DeFi could go as far as let's say you own a car, but you don't have any cash, um, and you don't have the asset to take. Gotcha. Okay, great. Well, I, I was saving like a bit of a bit of a juicy question for the end, which is kind of, I guess, where your talk concluded. We've still got some time, but um, we've still got another question. Yep, we've got one here and then one at the back. I mean, I, I don't know, like, how well the panel is like generally in the whole DeFi space when it comes to all kinds of products, but what do you think will be the product in 2020 that will take off the most? Let's say in... Volume. 
Who wants to field that one? Oh. You go first. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this is just a forced no, part. I'm not restrict it to Ethereum. Any okay. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'll pass around. That's right. Uh, anyone have a thought? Have a thought? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I was on, yeah. God, everyone's like, when, when a million uses, right? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, really, I mean, like, in the simple form, it's about narratives, isn't it? Like human beings, we communicate with stories, right? So the more narratives we have, the more that we tell other people, hey, I just made this money or hey, I just did this amazing thing. Hey, I played WoW and I'm, and WoW is really fun. You should play with me. Like, where are these narratives? I don't know where we're going to find them, but that's what we need, right? We need like DeFi is working in some way because the people who already have crypto want to go longer and expand their pot and their their pile, that's how I see it. That's the narrative I tell myself when I see what's happening. Um, and I tell that to my friends, but those who don't have any crypto, that's not enough for them to overcome that threshold of get, to get started. But hey, if I start, um, if I quit my job and just travel the world, maybe that's a narrative. They're like, hey, I want to get in on that. But I personally think the most popular one hasn't been created yet. Um, I love Maker, don't get me wrong. You just die every day. But there might be a way we could get around having a similar system without MKR. And when someone finds the time to build that, um, combined with a great UI UX experience, I'd be, I'd be really keen to play with that. That doesn't exist yet, but it's certainly doable. What do you mean you use DAI every day? Do you mean trade DAI or like... Um, a lot of our clients pay us in cryptocurrencies um liquid cryptocurrencies um and uh we get a lot of donations um on a daily basis in dai um and yeah i move around dai on a daily basis probably not every day but definitely most days every week but do you use dai to pay the bill or what do you mean like every day so um we pay our devs in australian dollars yeah. uh, and a lot of the engagement fees that we collect are in cryptocurrencies including dai so by using DAI, I probably mean moving DAI around. Um, I've also settled personal debt in DAI. Um, I'm not sure if that answers your question. Yeah, yeah. thanks. Um, from my perspective, I would say decentralized exchange for sure, but uh, that means um, like decentralized exchange token. Um, I, just, um, I just think decentralized exchange might, might get a chance to take off um, in near future. Hmm. <laughs> well, um, you mentioned decentralized funding models already, and we saw them taking off in 2017 quite a bit with the, the ICO waves, which are like a, a trillion dollar market. And I think that is a real cool use case for cryptocurrencies because it solves the problem of accessibility. Everyone can invest in anything. I mean, there, went, there was so much wrong with this ICO waves back then that finally regulators are jumping in and they stopped that. But I think that will be the next wave. Um, as soon as we see some guidelines of how to have a proper ICO, how to invest into a US company and how do I buy Apple shares on a blockchain? Um, I think that will bring a lot of liquidity into the cryptocurrency space and boost the DeFi market. Yeah, so don't exactly know. I guess the yeah the best is still to come. Um, I wonder whether even in 2020 or maybe the next uh, year or two that the, the biggest advantage to come from it is regulatory arbitrage, like holding US dollars without having a US bank account or even some of the older use cases of say, even buying drugs like on the, you know, online uh, with web, uh, the dark web. Uh, because that was a clear advantage that cryptocurrencies had over everything else uh, you could you actually buy something like that, uh, which you normally wouldn't be able to. Um, so maybe it's still going to be like that for a while uh, until something new comes along. But yeah, I still don't know. Um, sorry, I just want to head on a bit. Um, another thing, another two property I, I think was to take a look is a mixer. Uh, I think there's certain uh, needs for mixers. Um, like uh, yesterday, someone asked me to send some um, payment and then um, I have to send, but I don't want to disclose my address. So uh, I think a mixer would be some like, um, it would be popular. We're, we're getting there. Um, there's this project, sorry. 
yeah. um, there's this project called Tornado Cash, yeah, yeah, if you've heard yeah, of it. Of so it's, it's kind of young and starting, but hopefully with you know, enough people putting their ether in it, yeah. because you see the more we use it, the more privacy we get. Um, and it's basically just a system to anonymize your ether, essentially. Uh, and once we get that, yeah, that will solve that problem, I think. Sure. Absolutely. We've got the exact same risk by using Zcash. So if you use Zcash, there's the whole uh, concept of uh, shielded transactions, right? So you basically are able to move Zcash around in a way that makes it impossible for anyone to understand, to know what the value was and what the uh, recipient was. But obviously you can apply a lot of these um, analytical sort of uh, methodologies to track down who have been issuing Zcash or moving Zcash in the first place. Um, and that actually, there was a nice paper published about 18 months ago that basically showed you that it was, if you were using it naively, the privacy advantage that you'd get was quite, quite low, like almost null. But yeah, it's a great point. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. Yep. Oh, yeah. Explanation for five year olds. It's kind of like, you're going to do a fart, you're going to do it in a crowded room. Yes. If there's only two people in the room, <laughs> you're going to know who five is. That's right. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. <laughs> Who's the other person? <laughs> the regulator. <laughs> uh, actually, Tornado is making me think, though, like, one area that I'm, I'm sure a number of you have dealt with is this how much you can actually figure out like from, you know, block explorers. Um, it does make me wonder as these apps become more and more popular, what sort of things will pop up ancillary data mining stuff will pop up and, and will generate its own market. Like it's quite interesting when you start like we, in synthetics, we, we get people try to front run us all the time and we get tactile constantly. And I'm actually working on something about that right now. Um, but sometimes we, we go and we see something and we, one of us spends hours reading through, going back all through history, trying to figure out what, what is this doing? What is this particular bot doing and how it's doing? And I think that as we see more and more people doing things in crypto, it will be interesting to like, so I think what's ancillary things pop up. Absolutely. Great. I think time-wise we're technically up because I've heard the cleaners come in as well. So unless there's any final questions. Um, oh, there are. Okay. Now these questions. Yep. Yep, good, good point. Decentralized insurance? Um, yeah, there's, there's, there's already a great, uh, great project out there. He's actually, it was actually started by an Aussie. Uh, he lives in London. Uh, yeah, Nexus Mutual allows you to basically purchase insurance against particular smart contracts that you're interacting with, which is quite cool in a completely decentralized way. Uh, so highly recommend checking that out. Uh, it's called Nexus Mutual. Um, the guy running it's called Hugh. Um, as I said, Aussie he lives in London. Lovely guy. Uh, no, so right now we have a thing called just Max Quay, which basically we basically watch at the speed of you know of, of transactions that are being mined, and we basically say you can't uh, exchange faster than that, and it, it kind of acts as a speed bump. So our oracles are constantly pushing prices to us every few minutes. Uh, but as you can imagine, that delay allows somebody to see what's happening off chain. And, oh, ETH's got a big pump. I'm going to go and do a quick buy. I'm going to well, I'm going to reprice into ETH and synthetics and take advantage of it. Um, so we do max squay to try to create a sort of a speed bump, but it's not it's not perfect at all. So you still can front run just limited. There's it's there's definitely opportunities, and people are still trying to do it when there's enough volatility. Um, prices are going up and down. We actually saw someone recently do a ridiculous one with um, uh, manipulating the spot market of Maker because the liquidity was so small. Was so sorry, the volume on uh, Maker was so thin that someone was able to manipulate the spot market with Uniswap and actually profit on on synthetics. That one in particular, we we basically have to stop supporting assets with such low liquidity. But for other front running, we're basically pro creating a system where we're going to prevent people from basically cashing out their earnings until we've had a, a waiting period has expired. So we'll basically prevent you from re like if you exchange US dollars into, into ETH, you might have to wait a few minute waiting period. Once that waiting period is done, you can then exchange that ETH into something else. 
Um, and if there's uh, if you owe something, if we look at the price at that at the end of the waiting period, if we figured out you've owed something, then we'll basically we'll take it off you. And if we think that we owe you something based on the new price, then we'll pay it to you. So basically saying we're going to create this period where we'll see what the Oracle tells us after that period and base the price on that. Not, not at the moment you transact, but the moment a few minutes afterwards. If that makes sense. So maybe I didn't explain that well. Yeah. Cool. Um, I think we might have to call it there because we've got some packing up to do before we have to get out of the space. So um, thanks again to our speakers. If I get the names right, sorry. J Justin, Mehdi, Jay, Philip, and James. Thanks everyone. Yeah. If anyone wants to help stack the chairs, you're more than welcome. <laughs> Thank you.